the Fresh Outlook. I'm Frank Cipolla. U.S. voters have spoken, and now it looks as though we can expect a sharp turn to the right when the new Congress convenes in January. In what was a rout, Republicans not only won, but in some cases surprising even the pollsters with their larger-than-expected victories. Tuesday's results have repainted the political map of the United States to a very red graphic. But this is not the first time in recent history where the midterms cost the White House the alignment of Congress. Similar fates occurred to Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush. Clinton reacted to the defeat, saying the American people believe, a majority of them, that a divided government may work better than a united government. But that was before the GOP's very publicly stated mission to block any and all efforts by the President of the United States. That strategy led to very little getting accomplished, which angered the country and ironically led to the GOP taking control. People are tired of politics as usual. A portion of the political elite that... Does this mean that President Obama is now a lame duck? Or, with both houses unified, can anything meaningful pass? History says yes to the latter. It has happened in the past, but the past was a very different place in Washington. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government... That is the question. What does this all mean? Could we be looking at two more years of gridlock as the president fends off Republican efforts to gut some of his major achievements like health care? Or will President Obama take the midterms as a message to listen to the electorate and find common ground on major issues like immigration? Joining us to discuss this is Professor Bill Rosenberg. He's from Drexel University. We also have historian Christopher J. Klein. Professor John Davenport, who's the Director of Peace and Justice Studies at Fordham University, and also joining us from our Washington, D.C. studios is Tom Squitieri. He's an international journalist, an author, and a political pundit. Gentlemen, welcome all of you. Hi. All right, so let's, uh, before we get into the specifics of what it all means to President Obama going forward in the last two terms of his um, presidency, what is your take on it in a couple of seconds? What exactly happened? Well, I think what happened was, were two things. First, uh, this was a referendum on Obama, and I think uh, the electorate, such as we can say, spoke negatively about that. It was also uh, an election in which turnout, turnout was a major uh, factor, uh, and the Democrats simply didn't produce the turnout that they thought they would. Well, I want to cor correct something right at the top. You're Alan Sanders. Yes, and I, I apologize am. for that. I misidentified you. You're a professor as well. And historian and so on, and political science specialist. Uh, so what we had here, essentially, as I said at the top, is a rout. It, it really was, and I do and, agree. And I know they didn't use the word shellacking or thumping <laughs> as know. President Bush did, but it was still a route. It, it was a route, and I do agree that it was a referendum on President Obama. I do think you had a couple other uh, factors that played into that, that so-called six-year itch, you know. But at the same time, it was also looking at uh, the trends. You know, the turnout was a factor. Um, we've seen before, as we saw in 2010, that when the president is not on the ballot, uh, it does affect turnout at certain levels. All right, let's, let's talk about history, because this is important. We, we look back and... And every president has been tainted in some way, shape, or form. Second terms are not good for presidents. Even FDR, uh, when we talk about FDR, he was elected four times. But even in his second term trying to pack the United States Supreme Court, uh, there was some pushback as well. So we look back, in some cases, lovingly at right. FDR. But he had his problems in the second term as well. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I would want to mention, though, as being a little bit of a contrarian here, is this use of out of route and this, this mediated version about what took place. I think is really a little bit too simplistic because I think what you have to do is you have to look at this at the micro and the macro level. Before, so, before we do that, then let's talk about FDR if you don't mind. Okay, so if you want to talk about FDR, FDR did try and pack the Supreme Court. It was a political move. Mm -hmm. He lost his political move, but ultimately he won. Okay, he got through the legislation that he wanted passed. The American public and voice through the Congress sort of said, we're not going to let you change the composition of the court simply to allow you to become even more powerful and get your way. What he was trying to do was increase the number of justices so that his laws, or his procedures that he wanted to get passed, wouldn't be declared unconstitutional. That was what that was all about. It wasn't really a change in terms of direction about what the American public wanted. It was more of a procedural issue. Well, I, al well also in the second terms of presidencies, most uh, supporters, most colleagues, feel as though he or she is a lame duck going in anyway. So it really doesn't matter. And they don't need to... 
uh, cater to that president anymore because they know in two years he's gone. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah. one of the reasons I think second terms tend to be uh, uh, less less good or less uh, go less well for presidents is that everybody knows everybody else's weaknesses. So Congress understands what the president's weaknesses are, and the president understands what Congress, uh, Congress's weaknesses are, so they can play off of that much better. And so as a result, you get uh, a less success, because the, uh, the Congress and the opposition party is already looking for the next election, because as you point out, the president will be uh, a lame duck. And so they are in a better position to sort of see, OK, what, are th what is the weakness of the president? Where has he failed in his first term? What can we exploit there? And so you find that second terms tend to be less successful as a general rule. Well, let's talk about Ronald Reagan. We go to uh, historian uh, Mr. Klein here. Uh, Ronald Reagan had Iran-Contra, and, and a lot of Republicans and Democrats look back lovingly to Ronald Reagan, but he had his problems in the second term as well. He had his problems, and I think the thing you have to look at with Ronald Reagan is the factor of he also took responsibility for everything that happened with that. When he said, you know, the buck stops here, and, and make those statements like that, it showed leadership. And I do think there was, in, in this segment, in this uh, 2014, there was a segment of the population that was looking for some leadership, a uh, segment of the population that was looking for somebody to take some ownership and some control, and I don't think the electorate saw that in President Obama. Uh, you ha you, you no, I, I really feel uncomfortable with that analysis. Uh, I really think that in 2014, it was uh, a difference between the way the Republicans and Democrats cast the election. The Republicans wanted to make it a referendum on Barack Obama. Obama did not want to do that, but that type of balancing of which is the agenda that we should be considering happens all the time. Ultimately, though, what happened, I think, is that in 2014, the traditional Democratic cohort of supporters did not show up. Women did not show up as much. People of color did not show up as much. Young people did not show up as much. And that's a traditional pattern in midterm elections. So I think you had Barack Obama running in a stack deck of mostly Republican-held seats. You had three or four prominent Republic, uh, Democratic senators who decided not to run again, which created open seats, which created an avenue. If they would have run, I don't think we would have been talking about the House, I mean, excuse me, the Senate being taken over by the Republicans. I think the only no, fact... I was going to say, the only factor to play into what, what he had just mentioned is the fact that you also had the president who was not necessarily wanted on a campaign trail with Democrats. All right, let me hold you right here for a second. Let's go to uh, Tom Squitieri in Washington, D.C. How did you see this election coming down in, in an historical perspective as well, Tom? Yeah, for, I wanted to talk about Ronald Reagan's second uh, term as well. It's very interesting because Iran-Contra, many people would say, was a result of overconfidence and success of the Reagan administration. They won a big second term, his re-election. Uh, he had Democrats and Republicans basically in his camp for most of that. And this was, a, this was a reach by the people in his administration to do something, as opposed to what happened for Barack Obama, as your other guests pointed out, the lack of leadership, Democrats didn't want him. You know, what I found very interesting here Tuesday night, election night, was the complete absence of any activity in Washington, D.C. There wasn't an energy buzz. There weren't parties going on. There wasn't the excitement of, we're going to come in and do new good things for the country. It was more a reactive type of thing. Let's, in this case, let's get rid of the Democrats and tell people what we're not going to do or what we're going to do away with. All right, let's, let's, so let's your keep... other guests really put their fingers on a lot of the elements that make this unique, but I felt it was a hollow type of election in terms of uh, a spirit and, and a vibrancy. All right, let's start with you as we go through the other president who struggled in a second term that we, most modern day president, uh, Bill Clinton. Here we have a, a president who was doing well and of course he got ensnared in the Monica Lewinsky problem. Uh, Tom, what is your what is your take on that? And 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 as we look in history, uh, you know, how does that how does that relate to what's happening now? Sure, H having covered the, the, that scandal and the other Clinton scandals relatively intensely, um, it was a, a total drain on the resources of the Clinton administration and the efforts of people within that administration to try and do something in the second term to do exactly against what we've been talking about. In other words, escape that second term lame duck jinx that seems to happen to a lot of presidents. Um, so Clinton was done in by his own personal scandals. Uh, he managed to outflank Congress on occasion. He was a lot more craftier than Barack Obama has been in, in dealing with a hostile Congress. So in terms of compared to Clinton, um, Obama suffers by comparison. Well, let's go back to the panel here. Let's talk about President Obama for a second. Many people would say he doesn't have the, uh, the skills that a, a Lyndon Johnson would have, or even a Clinton, where he uses the White House 
to schmooze, for lack of a better term, and bring people together. I, I think I read something where he's only had John Boehner to the White House twice for a social yeah, event. Well, one of the yeah. interesting things, though, is also that Barack Obama has only vetoed two pieces of legislation in the whole term of his office. And likewise, the same thing happened with George W. Bush, hardly any vetoes. And part of that is because of the system of governance. You had uh, the Bush administration only putting forward bills that he was going to sign. And likewise, with the divided government, with the House being Republican, the Senate being Democrat for a good portion of Obama's uh, mm -hmm. career in the White House. He also had Harry Reid to run interference for him, so bills weren't getting put on his desk. Now we're going to see Bill Clinton. You've been looking for the historical parallel. Bill Clinton was told that he was irrelevant, okay? His popularity went through the floor, and what Bill Clinton said was he waved that finger just like he waved it about Monica Lewinsky, mm -hmm. and he said, you think I'm irrelevant? Watch this. And he just started vetoing legislation, which pulled the Republicans back and it ended up having them have to make deals with him. But so it would be interesting if Obama does something like Bill that. But Bill Clinton learned from his years in power. I'm not sure that Barack Obama has learned very much since he began his presidency. Barack Obama operates in a very aloof fashion. If you talk to Democrats as well as Republicans, mm -hmm. they will tell you he doesn't consult. He doesn't meet with us. He doesn't try to strike a deal. He's basically a flowery speaker. He, is a, he approaches the office kind of like a community organizer, and he puts people around the table. They discuss, they debate, but ultimately he doesn't push any power buttons or seek to make any deals. All right. And so that's his problem. Historian Christopher J. Klein, is this the time of the presidency when those who have been holding their powder take their shots at him? They know he's heading out the door. Well, they know he's heading out the door, and, and they may do that. Um, I think that'll be interesting to watch and see how that play takes shape. I think a lot of that is going to depend on what he does. You know, we've talked about the Clinton administration. Um, you know, after 1994, um, we saw Bill Clinton move to the center. You know, and I don't know that this president can do that based upon what happened in 2010. All right, we just you got know. a couple of minutes left. Let's go back to Tom Squitieri in uh, Washington, D.C. So what does the, uh, the last two years of the Obama presidency look like, Tom, in your opinion? Well, let me tell you what's going to happen next week. The House and Senate are going to do something we haven't seen before and pass a major funding child care programs across the country with overwhelming margins. That's going to probably be the highlight, the legislative highlight of the next couple next couple weeks. For uh, President Obama, he's going to try to uh, affect legislation that comes through uh, in a positive way for in infrastructure changes and interior changes to help the economy, at the same time running guard against the Republican efforts that are sure to come quickly uh, to, to gut the health care program and to uh, uh, minimize other programs that he had managed to get passed in his first four and six years in Congress. So uh, I think what some of your panelists said earlier is true. Uh, they will come at him legislatively with their agenda. The Republicans and the conservatives will come at him. And whether or not he has realized and learned his lesson in time to deal with them remains to be seen. All right, let's come back to the panel. We have, again, as I mentioned, just a couple of minutes. What does uh, President Obama's last two, term, uh, last two years look like? I think it's going to be a system largely of gridlock. I think what we're looking to is a situation where we're going to see names of very important pieces of legislation like immigration reform right. or tax reform. But at the end of the day, those are going to be very wanting because Obama's not going to accept many of the things that the conservatives want. And the conservatives aren't going to pass a bill that Obama wants. So both of them need each other to pass legislation. The Republicans absolutely have to get a bill that talks about immigration mm -hmm. for 2016. But will it really meet what the American public wants or what either the president or Congress wants? I doubt it. Alan Sanders, yes. uh, we're going to be talking about how Congress might work in the next segment, but for now, the president's last two years. Well, I think you're going to see gridlock. I agree with uh, my You agree with gridlock? I agree with get gridlock, and I also think you're going to see that the presidential election of 2016 started on Wednesday. So I think that's what we'll We have 30 seconds less. I, I agree with the gridlock idea, and I also agree that 2016 is already underway, and we're going to start to see all that shape up, especially those senators who are expecting to uh, throw their hats into the ring. Um, I do think it would be a good time for the president maybe to look back at the likes of Lyndon Johnson and effectively use the institution. Uh, he was a senator. I know he wasn't there for a long time, but he did should have formed some relationships at that point in time, work through those, have those things at the White House, invite the Senate Majority Leader and a Speaker over, uh, maybe more than two or three times. If that's his Achilles heels, that might be it. Right <laughs> that's it. Okay. <laughs> We're going to be back with the same panel in just a moment. We're going to continue our discussion, this time on the midterm elections itself, why they made history, and we'll be back right after this short break.